All right, can I hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, let me quickly check screen sharing just to be sure. This is what? Can you see my slides? Yes. All right, perfect. Thanks. Hey everyone. Greetings. All right. Give me a second. Let me pick up the meeting notes. Hello. Um, all right. So I think today's agenda is going to be the key talk presentation. All right. Um, let's see. Yeah, um, is JJ here? I think he said he was going to facilitate. But if not, if not, I can do it. All right, thank you to whoever copied up the, the template. Okay, um, we would need um, one or two scribes for the meeting. Um, scribe, scribing now is not going to be as um, um, as much a heavy lifting because we actually have access to the transcriptions now. So it's just a couple um, kind of action items, note taking. So if anyone would like to help out with scribing, that would be great. And I'll take the scribe. Uh, this is JJ. All right, JJ. Hey, JJ. Uh, I see you signed up to facilitate, so so I'm I'm good. If you want to facilitate, I can scribe. No, no, no. Go go ahead, facilitate. I'll just like that's fine. Okay. All right. Let's uh, give it a couple a couple more minutes uh, for people to trickle in. All right, um, so let's get started here, everyone. Um, so today it's going to be a presentation. Um, it's going to be for the key cloak assessment that was recently um, just wrapping up. Um, so I'm going to go through quickly kind of um, um, check-ins. I think there's uh, no check-ins for the most part. Mark, um, I see you posted a Slack message that talks a little bit, kind of summarizes some of the points we talked about the last meeting, um, which I think is also a good kind of list of topics that uh, we will be interested to hear as well. So um, 
I think it's it's a great list. Um, if anyone has any ideas or like to kind of talk about, uh, if one of these topics are interesting to you, um, please feel free to kind of comment on the thread. And and you know if we see that there is um, particular topics that are of interest to people, we can dedicate some time during the session to talk about them. Um, if not, I think let's just go ahead with the presentation. Um, actually, hold on. Um, Emily, Vinay, JJ, do you want to give a quick update on the white paper or shall we do the next week? Um, yeah, I think we are, uh, we can give uh, just a one minute overview to say that it's come, uh, there is a presentation that will happen uh, in the next meeting. Um, there's a group uh, that's been working to put together the white paper. Um, and uh, Emily, it is available, the link is available, right? For people to ask for. Yeah, the, the link is in the ticket. Um, so if folks are interested on in seeing where we're at, uh, I don't have the issue number in front of me right this minute, but um, you can jump on over to the white paper channel or go through the GitHub issue. Um, everything should be linked there. Right. And Vinay will be presenting uh, in the next, uh, presenting like a five minute version of it uh, the, in the next weekly meeting. Uh, so please feel free to pass the word around. Uh, please feel free to show up uh, and uh, engage in the conversation discussion. That's all. Uh, that's all I had. Right. Thanks, JJ and Emily. Yeah. All right. Let's go ahead with the people assessment. Uh, so this. Brandon, I got one other thing, real quick. Go for um, it. So, so Security Day North America is going to happen. Um, so if you, yeah, Justin's getting thumbs up. Um, so if you're interested in submitting a talk for it. Keep an eye out. I'll be posting more information in the channel, um, and we should have hopefully the website updated within the next week or so. Um, the program committee is solidified and firmed up, so keep an eye out. Um, and if you have questions about it, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank awesome. You. Thanks, Emily. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, let's. Go ahead with the the presentation. So the um, Bosa and was it Cyan? I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, will you be yeah. looking at the discussion? Cyan. Okay. Uh, great. So uh, whenever you're ready, please uh, feel free to to share your screen. All right. Just it. Yep. Take it away. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, so I'm Balak uh, Stian, who is with me. He's actually a Kikilok project co-founder. We are both in, in, with this project since the beginning. Uh, yeah, we'll do a quick overview. We'll focus mainly about security degradation parts and typical deployment and configuration mistakes. And just to highlight uh, this whole assessment document, turned out to be pretty lengthy. It's like over 30 pages in Google Doc. Uh, so we are skipping a lot of parts. So like, you know, uh, internal design, customization, and several other topics I'm, I'm not uh, addressing here, but feel free to go there. And yeah, I made a PR with Markdown conversion. I, I know I need to uh, fix some stuff in the PR, but yeah, it should be uh, on its way to merge merge into the repo as well. Uh, Stian? Yeah, can you hear me? I was troubling finding the unmute button. Yeah. Yeah, so um, giving a very quick uh, introduction to Kikook. Um, so Kikook is obviously a identity and access management solution. Uh, providing uh, various different protocols and integration options. Uh, we do OpenID Connect, SAML 2.0, UMA, OA2 uh, on the integration with the application side. Um, the one point to make there is that the core of Keycook is made 
protocol agnostic, so we, we are able to add additional protocols in the future if we need to. Um, then we support integrating with uh, external sources of identities. So we do uh, LDAP, Active Directory. You can integrate with a relational database if you want. Um, we have uh, various different integrations with social networks and also integration with OpenID Connect and SAML uh, identity providers. All right, so next slide. Um, we, we aim to make it really easy to run Keycock and have it ready out of the box with a with a, a single command. Um, we have uh, container images, of course, so uh, Kubernetes template examples. Uh, we have a Kubernetes operator um, and so on. Next slide. So just to illustrate how easy it is to kind of get started using Keycoke, this is showing our client-side JavaScript adapter uh, and basically wiring in uh, login to your application. So next slide. Um, obviously, once you're logged in, uh, you are redirected to Keycoke and its login pages to, to do the login. Uh, these are highly customizable and extensible uh, and can be changed to kind of match your look and feels. Um, and you can see here, it, there's quite a lot of options that are enabled, uh, but various things can be enabled and disabled as a configuration option. Um, we do strong authentication, of course, so OTP, web button. Uh, we allow support for custom flows, uh, and we are continuously ex extending in this area uh, to improve and, and make sure that we're kind of modern here. So next slide. Um, we have various different options for authorization. Uh, we have uh, roles, groups, obviously uh, anything that you need for like ABAC type roles. Um, we also have a fully centralized authorization service, uh, which has uh, integration with UMA. The next slide. Um, so as I said, we, we have federation of users, so I mentioned that before. Next slide. Um, we have a pretty extensive admin console. It uh, lets you manage and configure most aspects of, of a Keycloak server. So you can register your clients, manage your users, um, change configuration for your, for your uh, realm. Uh, you can manage authentication flows. You can manage sessions. Uh, you can view audit logs and so on and so on. So next slide. Um, we also have a console for, for self-service, so where end users can manage their own accounts, where they can reset their credentials, enable OTP or web button or whatever. Uh, they can also view what sessions they have logged in, and they can remotely uh, log out uh, external sessions and so on. Right, next slide. Um, so since we have end user visible uh, UIs, the login pages in the account console. Uh, we have a theming system that allows you to easily customize it and integrate it well into your existing applications or your organization's sort of, uh, look and feel. Um, we also have a huge number of extension points where you can add in uh, custom code to extend the server. A brief look at just the current sort of statistics around uh, the project. Uh, we have on Docker Hub, we have about 68 million pulls. Um, alongside of that comes uh, Quay.io. Uh, and then we have about 7,000 stargazers at the moment, 430 contributors. Uh, we have about 80,000 or so um, unique visitors to the website each month. And uh, from the website, uh, traffic, we can kind of see that the, the, the interest in the project is increasing uh, on a yearly basis. Um, was this yours, Bollock? Yeah, just to highlight, uh, Kikok doesn't need to be, you know, cover every single standard. Uh, we, we try to uh, remain fairly slim and focus on modern ones. Uh, also, because we, we, we stick with OpenID Connect, we also don't try to provide SDKs on integration libraries, but just rely on proven ones from, from given technology stack. Certainly not implementing any crypto algorithms ourselves, uh, not a Kerberos server, not an LDAP server, 
not a lot, uh, not a certificate authority. So, you know, we try to be fairly focused as well. Uh, on the, so that's wrapping up uh, kind of like the, the project overview, uh, just to be quick. Uh, if you have any questions, please do interrupt. I think slides are fairly uh, self-explanatory. So if, if, if you have any more focused uh, questions, that's also, also welcome. Uh, just to mention, there was one uh, more, more proper security audit founded by one of the customers or users of, of Keycock, which is uh, Reva, Reva Digital. Uh, and there were a number of CVEs identified. Uh, I think two of one of the info and one of the low nature are, are still hanging, uh, but uh, everything else was addressed. And in essence, the, the picture was good. Uh, how, how they described the project. Uh, as part of this assessment, there was one CVE identified which was patched and uh, was both in a community site or in a product distribution Red Hat was doing uh, last week. Uh, and in essence, it was a DOS attack due to a uh, week out of the box uh, settings. Probably not affecting pro proper deployments when, when the configuration was tweaked or properly fronted. Uh, but anyway, we, we, it was a, actually a fairly serious one, so we, we fixed it by changing some out of the box uh, server settings. So, uh, around security degradation, so obviously uh, it's a critical piece of infrastructure. It's an identity provider authorization server. So it's a tempting uh, piece of infrastructure to, uh, to attack and compromising Keycloak potentially has fairly devastating effects. So taking over user identities, uh, rendering applications unavailable uh, and pretty much the whole critical, uh, all of the critical systems can fall apart if, if Keycloak is compromised. Uh, some of the predisposing conditions uh, at each level of the technology stack, CVs do happen. So uh, OS layer, JVM layer, uh, application server we use as our runtimes, or especially various libraries we use for configuration parsing or for networking. Uh, those get patched once in a, once a while. Uh, lack of SSL, I'll, I'll talk about it a bit more. Uh, it's a, one of a foundation of OAuth 2. So because OAuth 2 is a uh, redirect based protocol and uh, so SSL needs to be in place. Also the, the redirect URIs needs to be secured properly. Uh, so there are several best practices around OAuth 2 you ought to follow and you ought to be aware of. Uh, and at the same time, like not securing the backend properly, so simple stuff or not keeping configuration up to date or not keeping up with server updates. Uh, we see some of those examples uh, once in a while. So rendering server unavailable, uh, that's potentially the easiest attack and ironically like that's what being identified as a CV as part of this assessment. Uh, impact and users not being able to authenticate to applications, depending how applications integrate and handle authentication, potentially also uh, impacting availability of those applications itself. Uh, to prevent, uh, the best would be to do a proper HA deployment with clustering, ideally with uh, separate da data centers uh, uh, and, you know, uh, ge ge geo separated. Also front key clock with proper rate limiting solution, load, load balancer and etc. And especially proper, properly tweaking the config and size of the deployment. On the server integrity part, uh, obviously it, it, it contains user sensitive data. So impact uh, at different level of granularity, gaining access uh, can be very impactful. So, you know, user, user profile information could be leaked uh, or user identity could be taken over. Uh, with, you know, if, if uh, tokens are leaked, potentially you can take over existing session user has with various applications. And the most catastrophic uh, possibility is gaining administrator access. 
uh, that's probably you know end of it. Uh, especially it's a, if it's a, an administrator of master realm, that this can be devastating. So on the mitigation, uh, there is a bit of a similarity of not using the root account in Linux, so not leveraging master realm admin account in Kiko case, but having separate admin accounts uh, with more fine-grained admin uh, permission constraints that's possible to configure. Uh, key rotation, both regular and in case of a bridge, that's also possible. In case of user session uh, take over, it's, a pos it's possible to also uh, enforce uh, not trusting refresh tokens which were issued before a certain timestamp. TLS is a must. Uh, also strong customer authentication, not only for application and users, but also for Keycloak administrators uh, themselves. Uh, a good, good uh, algorithms for uh, password credentials hashing. Also, there is a pluggable SPI, so uh, third-party vaults and different uh, sources can be used. Uh, limited to token audience, uh, database-level like encryption. There are also several uh, options in Keycog itself. You can enable like a, a simple brute force detection and so on. Uh, there is a whole section in the documentation called threat model mitigation, uh, which tries to go over typical attack vectors and discuss what can be done. Uh, like, you know, the proper hashing in, in case of uh, uh, database being uh, compromised or, you know, compromised keys and so on. Now, on the typical deployment and configuration mistakes, which are possible, uh, which would increase the risk of, a, of attack. Uh, so uh, when you provision a server, uh, there is a restriction. So admin password, initial admin password can only be set via local host uh, or you know, via browser, well, either via script, via command line, or uh, in a browser situation need to be local host access as well. Lack of TLS, like I said, that's a that's a cornerstone for anything odd related. But what often happens is that uh, in R and R and D situations, developers just go with uh, without TLS for experiments uh, or while working on it, and then uh, you need to remember that TLS is a must when you move to production. Uh, weak admin passwords. There is a fairly sophisticated set of password policies you can enforce, but those are not enabled uh, when you say the initial, when you set the initial admin password. So this need to be taken into consideration as well. Uh, yes, I was already uh, talking about the master real admin. admin. And yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's a uh, fairly deep software stack and bugs and CVs do happen at each layer. So keeping track of CVs and updates uh, as with any software is uh, a necessity. What we also see is, so password hashing uh, is a key, uh, but there is a trade-off to be made and you can go both extremes. If you go too far, you can impact performance. If you go too weak, uh, you know, in case database is leaked, uh, there is not enough protection. Uh, also, not maintaining proper size of the token. Uh, if you store too much of unnecessary information in a token, uh, uh, old claims, it impacts member consumption. And in such case, it will be way easier to do uh, denial of service attack. Uh, yeah, properly managing the, the strong authentication uh, and then not limiting the token audience and scope of applications. So uh, there are ways to prevent API misuse or limit the damage if uh, access or refresh tokens are leaked. And, uh, but again, developers need to be aware of it. Usually the, the biggest enemy of security in case of solution like Keycloak is a convenience. Uh, so again, like it's uh, developers pick up Keycloak, they experiment with it, they don't configure TLS, uh, they go with lazy paths, like uh, lazy path, like using uh, public old clients for everything, because they don't require credentials, or using confidential old clients for everything, 
but those cannot be securely stored uh, in client-side applications. Again, like for, for, for laziness and convenience during RAD, you can configure redirect URIs as wildcards, but then, uh, you know, there were actually a lot of uh, CVEs or uh, pretty dangerous things reported even by, uh, against Google or, or Facebook where uh, redirect URIs were not uh, uh, verified properly enough. So this is also a huge attack vector. And then, you know, there are certain capabilities not enabled out of the box, uh, which you can leverage in production, but you need to be aware of, of need to, to enable them. And uh, going to the end, so OAuth 2 and OIDC, uh, those are constantly evolving standards. So what was considered a good practice when OAuth 2 was released is not a good practice anymore, like implicit flow uh, is not considered something to be used. Uh, at the same time, there are a number of new newer RFCs like Pixie, which are now kind of considered a, a standard best practice to use. There is a new effort to to about 2.1 to kind of refresh and uh, include newer RFCs uh, and uh, kind of uh, remove the the, the 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 older outdated mechanism. But what, what I try to point is that you know you need to be monitoring the space and keep up with with uh, current situation. Uh, Stian, you want to take this one? Yeah. Um, so we have a bit of a focus going forwards on uh, ease of use and um, making it easier to scale Keycook out of the box. Um, and also making more um, decisions towards secure by default. Uh, by that, we are going to require HTTPS by default, uh, for instance, and we're going to require developers to be explicitly configure Keycook into to a dev mode. Um, and we're also looking at introducing uh, a policies framework around clients that can allow you to have quite strict requirements on what client configuration is used, as well as um, what um, how clients are using OIDC uh, and SAML. Um, and this can be leveraged then to, to for instance, uh, require all clients in your, your realm to use Pixie, for instance, or uh, to allow uh, requirements on on what kind of redirect you arise and, and all that kind of stuff is so we, we do have quite a lot of plans in this area going forward uh, yeah, try to keep it brief any questions i have a question if i may uh, i'm just wondering uh, if you could uh, just uh, compare and contrast uh, key cloak with uh, a lot of the other native capabilities in Kubernetes, as well as, you know, with other service mesh technologies that are providing authorization and authentication frameworks. So maybe it, it, it might be helpful, especially for me to just see the specific use case and, and also how does it compare or does it complement uh, Spiffy and Spire? Uh, does the question make sense? Uh, yeah, in a way. So um, we focus on authentication users and APIs uh, and uh, delegated access, right? So Open ID Connect and OAuth and that kind of stuff. While Spiffy Spy focuses on on uh, client to client to application to application. Um, so you know that there is no overlap in those two. That they are kind of uh, complement complementary rather than anything. Did you have other things in mind? Got it, yeah. Uh, and then I'm just well, curious, uh, do you get similar capabilities? Like let's say you take Istio, right? Istio has an authorization and authentication framework. Is this, uh, is, does Keycloak have a lot of those capabilities? How, 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 how do they position themselves? Are you complementary with those kinds of capabilities? Is, or is this uh, they ha essentially having, a, uh, for different use cases where, for example, if you're not using an Istio kind of a service mesh, you can, uh, supply, sub, uh, supplement with uh, those kinds of uh, use cases? It still uh, leverages OIDC for end user authentication, but it kind of ends at the ingress level. So uh, 
is to have OIDC integration, and then you can map also claims from, from the token it receives into uh, their airbag policies. Right. So you're saying um, it's a little different? I can probably try to explain this a little bit differently. So um, Keycock is your aiming to be your identity provider, right? So it is it's managing your users and it's uh, valid, validating users uh, and then issuing information about the users. Um, and then once a user is authenticated, then now you get into Istio and that will now, you know, based on the tokens from Keycock will now verify whether or not you have access, right? So um, we focus a lot on, on the server side and we, you know, on the client side, then we are more trying to integrate with what there is existing available, right? Rather than trying to duplicate that. I think also there's a bit of a fundamental difference in approach. So Kiko has, a, has more sophisticated authorization uh, capabilities like for ABAC attributed by a access control. But then it's, you know, enforcement happens at the application level. With Istio, the control plane and, you know, uh, proxy, uh, as Spiffy Spire, you kind of uh, could approach it in a way that you don't do any security within those microservices or application, and you kind of uh, apply it on top, uh, which probably for some, uh, for some actors, it's uh, it's it's a great approach because you know you, you kind of like take over security out of hands of developers, and then you apply the policies on top of of your graph of uh, endpoints and enforce them and, uh, at the sidecar level with proxy, and then do policies with this. It totally makes sense. Thank you both. If you don't mind, can I add to, yeah. So I would like to think so in Istio you have peer authentication and request authentication, right? So peer authentication is mainly used for the identity of the services inside Istio, which is handled by Istio D, uh, which is the identity provider or certificate authority inside Istio. But if you look into request authentication, which is basically based on JWT, and that JWT can be issued by any IDP, including key clock, right? So key clock can act as an IDP, which can issue the JWT, and that JWT can verify by, uh, you know, Envoy sidecar inside Istio cluster. So there are two types of authentication in Istio. Yeah. Exactly. No, perfect. Thank you so much, Benon. So I have a quick question about that, actually. Um, I just like to clarify. Um, so you're authenticating um, identities based on the set of identity providers that you've registered. Um, and are you just forwarding the tokens and the identity material forward to the application? Or are you also um, creating a token to, to kind of say that Keycloak has authenticated uh, this identity and these are some of the, um, the claims that it has? So it's, uh, if I understand the question correctly, um, then Keycock obviously issues two different tokens. So one is the ID token, which is there to establish authentication, which is typically aiming a, a front end application, right? And then you have the access token, which is used to typically invoke a REST API or a service or whatever. Um, so Istio being a service mesh, then that is a front-end application inv invoking Istio and passing on this access token, right? So that can then contain whatever information you need in terms on the policies that you set up inside of Istio with regards to authentication, right? So it can contain the subject of the user, it can contain roles or groups or whatever if you want to do that, um, or uh, any arbitrary uh, claim. Um, and then it's up for you know you how you set up the authorization in Istio on on what claims do you need and what um, what is needed for the, the the request to be permitted. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. That that's that answers my question. I had uh, I had one question in terms of uh, uh, account revocation and the SLA are uh, 
quality of service around that. Obviously, I think if you're maintaining session, is there a guarantee for uh, the time between revocation and the time it gets enforced? Or is that documented somewhere? Don't quite understand the question. So let's say you are brokering with the multiple different identity providers and then I revoke access or I shut off access to somebody. Uh, you're gonna have a long lived session uh, for a user, user session, right? And what is the session TTL and how do you deal with it? Uh, okay, so um, with uh, OIDC, for instance, you have uh, front and back channel logout specifications. So mm -hmm. you are in some way reliant on the external identity provider. Um, so obviously, Keycock is registered as a um, RP or as a client in that external identity provider. Uh, and that identity provider is then when the session is now invalidating at the external identity provider is now responsible of letting Keycloak know that the session is invalidated, right? So it is, is somewhat weak in that regard, right? Um, but this is really, you know, what there is available in OIDC, right? There isn't any sort of pulling or additional pushing me mechanisms on top of this. Mm -hmm. So you are basically relying on, on that external identity probably calling you and letting you know that it's, it's no longer valid. Um, but obviously, you know, we have um, mechanisms on top of that so you can manage your sessions inside of Keycloak and we have, uh, we have uh, session idle capabilities um, where if a user doesn't use a session for X number of minutes or hours or whatever, then, then that session will be invalidated. Um, and you can also limit the individual sessions to individual clients or how long the refresh tokens are valid. Um, you can also you know, require re-authentication after a certain amount of time. Um, nice. And we are also, we are going to put a little bit more into this as well. Uh, going forward, so we we do have some more thoughts there to to kind of narrow this down a little bit more, mm -hmm. right? But yeah, it is a continuous thing to <laughs> to also, manage sessions and we have a try though because at the very best level you apply with the lifetime of a refresh token and access token, and you know you can make them very short lived, but then the chit chat and back and forth between application and, and server will be an IDP will be way more frequent. Okay. So, so there's a there's a different detail between request request tokens and uh, session token as well. What you're saying? So, so yeah, there is a user session at the top, yeah. and then there is refresh tokens, yeah. and then there is individual access tokens. All right. three have different lifespans, right? Yeah. So um, and this enables you to do things like. Well, when, when I say a client uh, expiration time, uh, it's a client session time, that's then the refresh token, right? So you can have a sensitive application, have an hour long refresh tokens, which means that it constantly has to go back to Keycoak. It can also ask for the user to be re-authenticated after a certain amount of time, right? While you have other less sensitive applications that may have six month long sessions and be perfectly happy with that, right? So obviously, the when I say that there's areas that we want to improve on here, that's around you know the concept of these days people are expecting their sessions to just last, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. on a mobile phone, you want to be just logged in, and on on your desktop, you kind of want the same experience. You don't want to start your working day by having to log in everywhere. Okay. So it's finding that trade-off of how secure does your applications need to be, and how often do you have to bother your users for things, right? So this is an area we will be doing quite a lot in over the next sort of year or so, where we'll be working on, uh, for instance, like step up authentication where, you know, an adaptive authentication where you can have uh, certain rules saying, you know, like ask for OTP again, but you don't need to ask for the password, right? Uh, you have these kind of concepts in. Yeah, there's also the, uh, there is an extreme case if you want to leverage a lot uh, for service to service, is what called service token, and then you know you can say like for backend system the session lasts for a year on the extreme, right? 
uh, and then so it's kind of the same like uh, if you use corporate G Suite uh, like Google stuff like you probably need to re-authenticate every once like every two weeks or every once in a month but then uh, on an adaptive uh, kind of more smart authentication scheme if you switch a browser or if you come from different IP it pretty much always asks you to re-authenticate because it, it wants to confirm right there is there is a lot of flexibility. Okay, okay. No, it is yeah, it is like what Stain was saying, an open problem. Uh, it needs a lot. I just, I just want to add a few things like uh, you know, or in OIDC or all of this, enable the access to token to be short lived, so you can make a short lived access token and uh, you can keep your refresh token to be long lived. But you know, the the trade off will be the more frequent request for the you know the token exchange but it, there, there is a possibility to do that and there are like a, a psd2 or in the FAPI compliance there is a 90 days re-authentication requirement for a, you know refresh tokens and things like that so it is possible to make short-lived tokens but you know it's a custom set things maybe got it yeah thanks thanks james thanks for that um this is Chen. Uh, I have a quick question regarding the OSINT OSI part. I was impressed by the OSINT ability um, provided by Keycloud. But I wonder for the OSINT part, um, could I, is any is any way I can use some, for example, like a plugin model um, for if I already have like a, I'm using OPAR for like OSINT, is that a possible I can integrate with, uh, um, I use OSINT from key clock, but use OSD um, with OPA. Is that uh, possible? Um, did you? I'm not yeah. sure because I'm not sure I'm kind of understanding what you, when you say OSIN, I don't quite know what you're saying. Oh, or OSI, I understand. Uh, what, authorization. What Chen, yeah, what Chen is asking is, could you layer authentication and authorization as two separate layers? And uh, for authorization, could you make it be pluggable uh, to be able to use yeah. OPA yeah. or any other OTZ provider? Uh, yeah, so um, obviously the, 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 the authentication part is uh, step one, you know, on, on Keycock. So uh, the, the client is, or the application is free to use OPA if they want um to use that right no i guess stan the question is uh you said you have an abac based authorization model currently so is there a way to add something more pluggable more powerful instead of their abac model that's the question uh, okay so what what we have basically we have the a off the back <laughs> so we have the attributes right so you can manage your roles with inside kiko basically adding roles to your users uh, but there is nothing assigned to them, right? It has no meaning until you've encapsulated that meaning in your uh, your um, policies and your authorization on your client side, right? So, uh, yes, roles are just metadata, right? Uh, and it's up to your, your application then to interpret those roles. Um, unless you're using our centralized authorization services uh, where you can utilize roles and you can you can define policies on on access and this kind of stuff um but that would be an alternative approach to opa right yeah if you don't lose any information if you're just like propagating out the attributes then you can you can use um a policy um, decision after that um so i i wanted to kind of um take a moment to to see whether we make sure we have enough time at the end um, to kind of look at the recommendations. Um, uh, Ash, do you have something that you'd like to talk to about that? Uh, so yeah, we essentially went through a long process with branded, uh, with uh, Boleslaw and team, so thank you very much. And we uh, gave them some initial recommendations for the self-assessment. Uh, which they've addressed uh, in the document. So after this presentation is done, uh, the review team will sync up again and uh, we will provide some final recommendations to the project. So that's the uh, time, uh, that's the uh, next step, I believe.
Okay, I mean, great. Few things I would suggest uh, based on the questions that we got uh, is uh, clarifications around uh, uh, clarifications around the um, user-based authentication versus uh, service-to-service uh, based authentication and then clarity and separation. I think uh, although it's there, might be useful to highlight because of the questions that we got. The second one uh, that I had was uh, uh, the one that uh, Brandon and I think sort of uh, what I was asking as well was uh, the tokens, uh, token life cycles, different tokens and token life cycles uh, and how they are managed uh, and make it more explicit. Uh, the third one is the layering of uh, authentication and authorization in uh, either have the ability or we don't have the ability to be, uh, to have a pluggable or the things. Uh, those things came up as highlights. So I'll just mark that in the notes on this uh, and we'll probably address them. JJ, can you add them as comments to the assessment doc? That'll be like more helpful. I'll do that. I'll do that. Yeah, and if they're in the chat, the link to the assessment doc. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, that's all I had to add to Brandon. All right, cool. Um, so any any more questions about the assessment or cake look? Uh, hey, maybe one Robert. from my end. Oh, Sorry, Robert, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay, <laughs> just a quick, uh, more on the process uh, of the assessment itself, kind of any kind of metrics or how much time, effort, uh, uh, any suggestions for improving the process? I Is think that the I, question for, for the, the reviews or the project leads or both? It would be interesting to know both, how much effort was spent on the project end and, and of course on the assessment end. I, I would let Bolsla and team answer that first. I, I was a bit surprised when I realized it's over 30 pages in Google Docs uh, somehow. So between initial drafts and then incorporating feedback, I think end of the day, if I combine everything, I spent a few days worth of work uh, writing this down. So can it's, I ask, um, this is Michelle Traberka, and, and to that note, um, so you're a pro you're you're on the project itself, and you did your own assessment. That's the, the well. It's it's a conversation. So there was a lot of comments and feedback, and it was kind of like a living, working document. So some of the some of the changes were applied uh, by the reviewers uh, and kind of like discussed, and some. Some I wrote myself based on the feedback and then kind of like back and forth, like does it look better, does it clarify, and so on. Yeah, I, I guess my feedback on that is that um, that's typically not how a security assessment is done in my experience. Um, I find some of the security assessments to be more threat model-ish, and then I find some of them to be more um, like a rapid threat assessment, um, but I, it's just not clear to me what the rules of the road are. And um, so it's just a little fuzzy. I, I, I'm concerned about, um, I mean, I thought it was a good job, actually. I was, uh, you know, you reasonably, you called out uh, a lot of the qualities that, um, and concerns, areas of concern that I probably would have called out as well. Um, but I just wonder about the, sort of separation of duties in that and, and how that could appear. Thanks. Maybe I can make a quick comment there that might be helpful. I think we have done quite a few of these assessments and there is a ticket open to hopefully have a single document or somewhere that we can capture the objectives and the, or the goals and the non-goals of these assessments. And I think at one point we did uh, 
yeah, I think Justin Kepos, I don't know if he's on the call, you know, he does a great job of articulating the goals. Uh, and um, uh, it, it's not to do like a penetration test kind of uh, an approach, but it is to perform uh, more of a, a best practices assessment. I'm probably not doing justice to it, which is why the ticket's there and we can capture it. But one of the non-goals is that it's not like a, a red team pen test kind of an approach when this assessment is done. Yeah, I don't, know if that's I, I don't think that was my point, Vinay. I, okay. I, I am pretty familiar with, I've worked in security for more than a decade and I'm pretty familiar with the difference between a pen test, a threat model and assessment. I'm just, I'm concerned that it um, is misleading to use the term threat um, security assessment, given that the, um, the roles and responsibilities aren't clear. I mean, maybe I sound like some pissy finance person and I guilty as charged. Um, I just think when you use it, this term that such a term like that, you should be clear in um, a little clearer from what I've seen than because um, <laughs> you're saying you're doing an assessment, a security assessment. And, and you know, I'm not trying to be a dick here, but uh, it, it's, I, I, I feel like, you know, if you're going to say that you're going to do it, you, you then it, it, we should have it clearly defined. Um, and it just, I, I feel a little uncomfortable with it. As just well. to wrap up yeah. Uh, so Michelle, these are all really good points that you brought up, um, both at the last meeting as well as here. Um, and I, I saw that you had submitted issue 415 about this. So we actually have this whole assessment reevaluation coming up in our September 23rd meeting. Um, so I think that'll be an excellent opportunity to dive deeper into a lot of this because we've, we've been doing these assessments for a while, like was previously had mentioned, um, and a lot of these concerns have come up in the past. So we want to make sure that we're getting everybody's feedback on the same page. Um, so next, the next meeting that we'll have to talk about that is September 23rd. In the meantime, I'd be interested to hear more from the Key Coke team how they felt the responsiveness of the assessment team the volunteers working with them on creating the documentation and does the key Cloak team feel that the work that was currently done and the product that was actually produced as a result of what we're currently calling the assessments was beneficial to them or to their customers or to their security understanding of the cloud native community. To, to wrap up on my experience, I think uh, the, on the responsiveness part, like no compliance, I think it was very good. Uh, it was so I think like ironically the the core part of this presentation so this whole security degradation and kind of like what, what are the typical scenarios and what are mitigations I if I recall correctly like initially it wasn't there that much and I was I think I was forced uh, well forced uh, by your comments and really to do it this way and to structure it this way and well, it was a bit of work, but it was actually a, a, a good thinking process to go through. Kind of like, okay, so are we doing this? What, what do we do for this scenario? So on the project side, actually, it was, it was uh, I think it was a good exercise to be asked to, and kind of like pointed to, 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 to do, do this, uh, consider, well, consider how we address or how we look, uh, uh, how the project fits this frame. Thanks, Vosa. Um, Cyan um, or Ash, any any comments on the 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 key club assessment? I I don't have anything to add. It was Bollock from our side that did most of it. Yeah, I just like to add that uh, like Bosla and Teeth have been like super responsive to all the suggestions we provided, and there have been a lot of back and forth between the two teams. So I, I really appreciate on behalf of the review team, uh, the effort by your team boss love. So uh, thank you very much on that. I think that's pretty much my, my assessment of this. Cool, and, and also I know a couple other reviewers uh, on the call as well. Um, so feel free to come kind of just um, give a few words if you have anything in mind. All right, 
Um, so if there's nothing else for Kiko, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Vosa Sian um, and the the Key Club assessment team, um, Ash, Krishnan, Erina, and Emily, um, for the hard work here. I think it's a great assessment. I look forward to kind of doing a, a deep dive on this. Um, kind of uh, hits up a few other things that are coming up. So we have um, the white paper discussion that's going to be um, happening next week. And also we have a discussion on the 23rd of September that kind of touches on some of the things that, that um, we started talking about around security assessment. Um, we have kind of reached our initial target of uh, the initial assessments that we wanted to do, the five initial assessments that we wanted to do. And then to do now, we can take a look back at them, see whether they worked well, or what we want to do better in the future. So that's a discussion that will be on 23rd of September. If not, um, any other uh, ideas, questions that we want to bring up in future meetings? If not, I think we can we can get five minutes back. Awesome. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks for running. Thanks. All right. Thank all you, right. everyone. Thank you all. See you. Have a good one. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.